I think we're live. Well, thank you all. I really appreciate you having me today. The uh, whether it's short notice or not, actually, uh, eh, we'll have to do it from here. Sorry about that. The uh, whether it's short notice or not, I'm really excited about, about presenting about the Redmond Wetlands Complex. It's an exciting project for our community, but then there's some ancillary benefits to this project that really uh, have a common thread with Kiwanis and it's really focusing on public education and then also public access for people with all abilities so I'll get into that a little bit more but the the first question really is why am I talking about the Redmond Wetlands Complex and it's a project to expand our wastewater treatment operations so we were talking about I think Hope Park and the Dry Canyon and all these nice features and the crown jewel of the Dry Canyon and when you get to the end we're not the upside of it <laughs> we are the downside and it's not the shiny star that everybody hopes it to be when they exit the Dry Canyon and so this wastewater plant was originally built in in the late 70s and that was our first wastewater system we're kind of new to that world unlike a lot of communities I've worked for in the past this system's brand new in, in the scheme of things even this system's not that old and so the Clean Water Act kind of drove us all to building wastewater plants and making sure we were protecting our water resources but this wastewater plants had a few expansions in the Dry Canyon the most recent significant expansion was in 2000 and so since 2000 as you all know in this room our population's grown quite a bit and they only build these for so much capacity so we're really close to the capacity the ability for this treatment plant to clean the water to ensure that we protect public health and the environment we're really close to that capacity so the city a few years ago started planning that hey we need to upsize this and obviously uh, we probably could have done it about five years ago looking at how much population growth we've had over the last two years just because it's been accelerated and so we we started design a few years ago but council awarded engineering services in 2021 and then we started pre-design in 2021 final design begins pretty much now we just got awarded by council for final design and then final design will be completed this time next year with the goal of having construction start on the new fiscal year but in august 2023 and then goal of february 2026 the project being completed so really um you know why we're why we were building it's just because of our population growth how we're building it's pretty unique you can take a lot of approaches on how you build a treatment plant but the core of how we build a treatment plant is no matter what we got to protect public health in the environment no matter what we have to do that and so as we design this plant we have to build a plant that can do that and make sure the effluent that goes out is going to protect the public health and the environment we also also want to be somewhat smart and not going for an expansion in five years right after we build one and try to project the population so we can serve the community growth over a 20-year period that's a little challenging in Central Oregon but that's what you that's what your main two goals any plant being built you're doing those two things as a government entity this one's a little you know this could be questionable you know what is fiscally responsible you know this you could question a lot of government entities like were you fiscally responsible but ultimately we're supposed to have that as a goal when we're designing a treatment plant and this one's a little bit unique this this there you don't really design treatment plants to have any ancillary benefits to the community our job is to treat wastewater one thing that we brought into this equation, or, to, or a few things, was this. But then one of my goals when I came two and a half years ago and I was given this project, we were going a different direction and looking at just expanding in the Dry Canyon. 
and we started looking at alternatives because I wanted to look at options that were actually going to fulfill this, keep our rates low because we have the, actually the lowest rates in the state for a community our size. They're significantly lower than, than this region. The next closest rate is around 40 some dollars per month. Ours is still in the $33 after council approved the budget last night. But we, we have very low rates. Let's keep those low. Let's stabilize that rate structure for the future and then also let's let's add some ancillary benefits that goes beyond just a gated wastewater plant how can we benefit the community more than just that and so just a a little bit just to highlight this is where we're at you're all probably pretty familiar at least you smelled this one time you might have seen us and we're proposing to move the project out of here to demolish this site, return it to its natural state, or repurpose it for some other parks feature other than a wastewater plant, and relocate to our irrigation and biosolids disposal site that the city in, in the late 70s also procured. And this is where all of our effluent is discharged and all the biosolids, which I won't talk about, but if anybody has any questions about, that's where their land applied. And so the city has managed around 135 Five acres of orchard grass that we sell locally and then we also have about 607 acres that we utilize on that property for effluent and biosolids disposal so here's our existing plant and we were planning to expand this site when I when I got on board but as you can imagine what that would have looked like is two more of these here a giant solar dryer that looks like a football field that would have been a glass uh, solar dryer and for all those golf balls coming in that would have been entertaining right it have been good target practice but it would have been a lot of maintenance and then upsizing our biosolids area upsizing disinfection area because our goal right now based off population go growth this plant can treat 2.8 million gallons a day we're upsizing it to treat about 4.7 million gallons a day. That way we can serve a community around 55, 60,000 people. And so once we did that, right, if our community kept growing, what are we gonna do? Because this is all the land we own. We're gonna run out of options. And usually when you run out of options, you start looking at emerging technology scientifically to go, how do we optimize what we have? But as you know, it's it's, I can tell you the comparison of what this would have been versus what we're doing, which we're building a natural system, and I'll tell you why, and it's just because we have land, but this is a mechanical, electrical, chemical system. And so it's the comparison as far as operation and maintenance and cost is like comparing a pond to a pool, right, an in-ground pool. You've got the chemicals, you've got the concrete, you've got all the maintenance requirement, you've it right it cost a lot initially and it cost a lot over the life of a pool a pool doesn't cost you a lot after you build it you know and so they're very easy to maintain over time but we we looked at i looked at this site and, and the city looked at this site and said we're not really thinking ahead if we keep expanding here and and focusing on this end of the dry canyon, we're gonna run out of options and it's gonna cost our community a lot of dollars. And so there's no way we're gonna stabilize rates or keep them low. Out at this 607 acre irrigation and biosolids disposal site, we're going out Northwest Way. It's about three miles Northwest of our current site in the dry canyon. So when you go, if you're ever driving out this way, you'll see a big red gate and that red gate's the entrance to our uh, irrigation site but the orchard grass this doesn't exist out there right now just these and some drying pads for those biosolids and then a recycled water pond so why we looked at this site and and said why would why don't we move now is because we have so much land we have the ability to, to serve this community well beyond 20 years well beyond 40 years 60 years but then also we have the ability to do a different style treatment to build a natural treatment system which is going to be lagoons and wetlands 
which just like that comparison to pools and ponds is much lower initial cost and then a much lower life cycle cost and it even gets lower when you go to expand it again so say we want to ser serve a hundred thousand which that scares us all but potentially this area could go to that is this sets us up for success we build another one of these right here add a few more water features here and we're serving a hundred thousand but at a very low cost that's a that's a quick nickel tour of why we're doing it and what we're doing but why i'm here and and why it's exciting to present to all of you is the nexus between our youth and public education and our community and that this is going to have an ancillary benefit beyond just a treatment plant historically we've served the youth and the community by offering tours of our treatment plant but our our facility is not designed for public access it's definitely not designed for people with all abilities it's very mechanical industrial we do not allow for ada accessibility in a lot of the areas and so one thing we really want to focus on is we're putting all these water features in the desert we're we're creating this you know enhancing this open space it's already had a lot of wildlife on it historically but adding a lot more water features so now we're we're going to preserve that site for wildlife there won't be shooting out there we'll, we can create it in a way that is only going to allow passive recreation and so we're going to create a sanctuary for wildlife but then also the community to go out and enjoy open space but anyone with all abilities to be able to do and so the first is is starting with our support facility typically we're currently in trailers right now in the dry canyon those trailers were bought in the 80s and so this is actually expanding on our support facility but adding a feature that, that we think is going to be really cool and it's actually going to be about a thousand square feet here is going to be an interactive display area focusing on physical sciences water resources water conservation jobs in our community specific to wet utilities the wildlife that will be you know habitate that area out there and then also that that display will have different opportunities too to learn about the cultural of that area because there was a cultural presence throughout that area we found we find lots of artifacts in that area because of its proximity to the deschutes river and so we we want to add that component to as well but these interactive displays are pretty cool and if anyone's been to the lot alliance and wanting to support our youth and help them learn about water resources help them learn about physical sciences help them learn about careers there's those biosolids it doesn't look like that but then also um help them uh, help them learn about water conservation which is critical to this region we inside that lobby that i just showed you is we can add all of those interactive displays in another place instead of you going to juniper golf course you can have your lunch delivered out here to this conference room that the redmond school district we hope utilizes part of their curriculum and brings their classes out there but then we hope a lot of these groups that have supported our community come out because the best view one of the best views in the city will be here if looking out these trifold doors that will go out to a patio beyond the conference rooms are going to be the mountains and then the wetlands features not far away and it is a beautiful view if you've been out there of looking at all the mountains and so beyond just having a support facility indoors with interactive display for the community and is to enhance that open space features out there at the site and so this is kind of an example of a this is right now at the 30 percent design what we're looking at this would be the public access road out to one of the wetlands this is going to be a pavilion the everything is going to be made to where it's ada accessible anyone with all abilities would be able to utilize the site there'll be wet bathrooms this is actually not it looks like a lawn here and as much as we like green space 
we've got to support water conservation and so what we're building is a zero scaping garden to where you can learn about plants that you can plant and take out some of your greenscaping and put in different drought tolerant plants but then also there'll be picnic tables to enhance that experience to learn about the water conservation there'll be educational kiosks to learn about water conservation right there where we get our water and then we'll have a trail system which i'll talk about next that will really be centric to a water resource trail a wildlife trail and then a cultural trail with different kiosks throughout we're building benches that are covered so to offer a lot of opportunity for someone to enjoy the site here's the trail system i was talking about there's the the kind of the site with the zero scape demonstration garden but you've got a shorter loop that will be paved you've got larger loops that some parts will be paved and then gravel loops and then each one of these loops represents a different experience educational experience for the community again just highlighting what we're going to be hopefully focusing on with that indoor facility and outdoor facility as far as um, education for the community but then also education for our school si system the redmond school district has really stepped up and partnered with the city and and formed a group to assist with helping design a lot of these educational kiosks and then opportunities for the youth to use as part of their curriculum in in school here's a, an actual rendering as you know this was taken when the fire was happening so that's why it's so smoky but those theoretically would be the normal mountains in the background but this is an overlay to the site and this is actually what that natural wetland system that's the look and feel of it they're pretty shallow they they have a lot of opportunity and areas for wildlife to be protected and if has anyone been out to prineville or if you've been out to our recycled water pond it's 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 a um it's a sanctuary for especially migrating birds so out of our recycled water pond it's out there which most people don't travel out to we've had 10 tundra swans there's seven eagles out there but the amount of wildlife out there because it's protected you can't shoot the activities limited it's it's created a sanctuary for wildlife this is just adding a lot more opportunity to enhance that sanctuary and the Crooked River Wetlands has been a huge success story. Prineville completed a project where they built a natural treatment system. Again, it, it was the only option because they couldn't afford a big mechanical expansion. They went from basically, and, and this is, this is what, 2008 or something, but a $60 million option down to a, I think a 14 million or seven to $14 million option. And then also the life cycle cost extremely low. And so having some of the highest rates, they pay about $55, $60 per month for wastewater. We pay again, $33. They couldn't add any more to that. And so this is why natural systems offer the best opportunity if you have the land to keep your rates low, to stabilize rates. But then again, they what they started to see is that people wanted to use this site. So Crook County Schools, the Audubon Society, have all benefited from this site and it just keeps growing in popularity even when you go out there and you think how far it is removed from from a lot of towns in central Oregon there's people traveling from Bend there's people traveling from Redmond just to visit a wastewater plant which is which is odd right so I wanted to keep this one quick I know I covered a lot fast but I wanted to turn it back to all of you for questions there'll be another presentation when we get 100% design and that's where I really want to dig into some of those opportunities where where I think uh, there's a nexus between Kiwanis and us and uh, potentially supporting one of the interactive displays dis supporting one of the uh, the kiosk educational kiosk but looking for those opportunities with you and I think ultimately what we need from Kiwanis is support for the project just in general because they're gonna let me build a wastewater plant I have to do that nobody's gonna say no or there's a moratorium on our community and usually that doesn't make people that want to make money off development happy right and so I have to do that 
I have to make sure it protects public health and the environment. But what I don't have to do is add any of these public access and educational experiences, which we feel will pay dividends for this community. It'll serve as an opportunity for, community, for youth to learn about water resources. It'll serve as an opportunity for all of our community members and, and Central Oregon to have an oasis in the desert to get away, to get out of town, and to see wildlife and experience wildlife, and but anyone and, and everyone, no matter what your ability to utilize the site. So thank you for allowing me the, the quick presentation, and I'll turn it to you for questions. I live between the Maple Street Bridge and the sewerage treatment plant. So you love it. Um, and, and, oh, and we don't smell it. Uh, yeah. Um, but we have a deer problem occasionally. Mm -hmm. uh, are you going to take my deer away from me? Uh, <laughs> no, you know what, uh, you know, as you go out for stall, right, and, and 19th there, that the city owns, we own where the wastewater plant is, and so say that's where restored to its natural state, right? And then there's that those big fields out there right out from the plant. That's that's where the deer travel a lot. And so I don't know if they're gonna leave that area. You know, they feel pretty protected down there to come out to the new site, but it will attract deer out in that area. I think it'll be pretty attractive to wildlife because we're not gonna allow shooting. Currently that site is designated to not allow shooting, even the BLM area, but no one's controlled it. So we'll be able to control it as a city and it'll enhance that experience for the wildlife to go, hey, we feel protected, we feel safe. You add water, you add food, typically things come. So I don't know if I'm stealing yours so. though. Oh, you can have all of my deer. Yeah, you can bring them out there, just do it at night. <laughs> yeah. you, you mentioned our, our capacities of 2.8 million gallons. Yeah. Right? What are we currently running at? We're and close to 2.6. 2.6. Yeah. So that's not a lot of. There's not a lot of leeway, and yeah. you know, you grow by four or eight thousand a year, and you know, usually uh, every one of you uses about 80 gallons per day. So you you give me about 80 gallons per day, you know, to treat, and so just keep. You can do the math. It's mm -hmm. scary sometimes when you look at it. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, a, a treatment plant's pretty conservative in its design. And there's usually a little extra capacity, but yeah. sometimes there's not. And the, the other question I had is, tell us about when the water enters those ponds, what, what quality, what state is it at? You know, as yeah. far as health-wise and clarity-wise yeah. and cleanliness wise wise No, really good. The, uh, Just don't eat the ducks. <laughs> oh, you've eaten, if you've eaten a duck, you've eaten one that's been in a wastewater pond. I hate to break the news. <laughs> <laughs> they, they love it. Uh, but um, so the, the effluent quality is is got to be the same no matter what treatment plant you have. So the high side is before the water goes back into the ground, which all of our water is either utilized, it's all going back into the ground, but we utilize some of it for irrigation for the orchard grass, and the remainder of it there and up here is goes back in and recharges the groundwater. And so, as we run through this treatment system, this site is actually going to be fenced off from the public. This is where the heavy lifting is done. So this is where the wastewater is entering and through these cells, which are designed to break down the organic matter. And then also, you know, as it goes through here, it, it cannibalizes itself. We use microorganisms basically to do that process and anaerobic digestion at the bottom, which is kind of cool, is those biosolids I talked about, for every pound that comes into our plant right now, we have to waste a half a pound. That's not a half a pound of human matter or, or what's being, you know, entering the drains. That's, that's actually really a half pound of microorganisms because they're growing, they're eating all that food and they grow, so we're wasting them. And there's some inert matter in there as well. But, this cannibalizes itself, so we, we produce a fraction of the biosolids. But 
this is where the organic matter, this is, this is where you don't want to go swimming. This is the duck you don't want to eat. <laughs> but then as you leave this, um, these final ponds is where it settles. And then this clear effluent travels out of it. And we built to, to have a, to minimize our impact in this area, we've actually built an underground disinfection system. And so then it's disinfected underground, which that's going to remove out all the harmful pico coliform, anything that could get you sick. And then it goes into the treatment wetlands. And so these are a polishing wetlands. They're still going to be removing nutrients, that organic matter. They'll even uptake metals, depending on the plant life in there. But they're still doing treatment. We have this fenced off. But I can tell you this, I'd rather go swimming here than at the Deschutes River just downstream of that park in Bend. Because if you measure the water quality, it's pretty hot with fecal matter, right? It's, it's pretty gross. This, this is not going to have any of that. It actually looks pretty good, but per, per requirements, because there's still treatment, we wouldn't want anyone to enter that. But it's safe for all the wildlife, it's safe water. And then as it goes out to these final potential disposal wetlands or the infiltration, that's where there won't be any, we're just gonna put a little, uh, even around this will just be a little wire just to say, have a setback. But out here, there won't even be that. And then it's completely safe, you know, as it goes back into the groundwater. But it's pretty, it's, like I said, there's, you'd wanna swim here than a lot of the, the water features, you know, that you're aware of in the area. This is regulated and we're disinfected where those aren't. So my question is, I love this. I, I did environmental studies for a few years. So I love, and, and wetlands and marshes are like my thing. Um, <clears throat> the chemical treatment plant at the end of the canyon, how long would it take for that to get put back to normal? Or oh, fast. Reclaimed. <clears throat> yeah, so it'll be, uh, I if it's got about two million budgeted, it's gonna be a rip and tear project. We'll recycle whatever we can. You know, once we transfer and the flow starts going here and this is stabilized, then that will be shut off. So we the will, deer will have some place to go. They will. Yeah, there you it's go. A, they got to cross a few roads, though, so they might not make it. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I would, our goal is that I've got a budget, you know, which has already been added to our budget as far as being able to demolish this, <coughs> sell the land. More than likely, parks will get it. And then they have some opportunities there. The community has some opportunities to, to weigh in in that stakeholder engagement. Like, what do you want it to look like? Do you want it to look like just the natural, you know, most of the natural part of Dry Canyon, or should that be turned into something? Like, should we turn those uh, orbels into ice skating rinks, right? Maybe a lot pole. Skate park first. Skate park. <laughs> a lot of opportunity, but but if if anything, we'll we'll demolish it, remove it bury some of the concrete, break up the concrete, bury it, cover it with the natural landscape. Yeah. And it'll be within a year. Wow, that's quick. Yeah, once it's wow. switched over. <clears throat> yeah, the earlier slide showed the schedule. What were the, what's the date for the completion of the new project? Uh, so this is estimated to be complete at the February 2026. 26. Yeah, could be sooner. Could be the summer of 2025. And then a year later, you'll get rid of the old system. Uh, we, we'll probably start on it right away. In, in 2026, let's say in February, we start switching it over. As soon as this is up and running, we've, we've worked out all the kinks, then we'll, we'll shut the, the lights out on this one, and then probably have a contract in place would be my goal to start the, the, the uh, recycling all the materials and demolishing the site. Well, I've been out to visit though system in Prineville. Yeah. Uh, Prineville. And it's fun to visit. No, I see the wildlife there. Yeah. And the eight <clears throat> accessible pathways. And what's what's crazy about it is that was wasn't a really thought that went into it in Prineville is the public access component. Mm -hmm. That was an afterthought. They just said this is the trade the cheapest option. <laughs> and then people realized, look, there's a lot of potential here. Mm -hmm. And so this one, there's a ton of topography here. There's a lot of juniper trees. You've got all the mountains. It, this, this is gonna be a crazy sight when you look at it. It's, it's, it's gonna be beautiful, if we can pull it off. So, 
Are you going to have a headworks still <laughs> yeah. right where you are presently so that you can clean the watt the enough to pump it and you can use the same <coughs> pipe to pump it out to the new facility? Yeah, good. both really good questions. So we've got easements for two 24 inch stick or pipes going out to there. We're replacing one of the 24 inch pipes in the existing trench. Good thing about the pipes, they blasted in the 70s, they, they blasted a big trench. And so we're able to put a 48 inch pipe in that trench. So we'll, we have the ability to gravity from here. So we're just gonna do a little bit of work in the, the dry canyon and gravity out to here. And this is where our headworks will be located. So the whole treatment process will be out here. We'll have some, we, we currently have manholes, but we'll have a couple more manholes that are required for that gravity pipe. But other than that, there's not gonna be a lot of change in that. You just won't see the headworks down there. And that's where some of the odor comes from. I'm a retired high school science teacher. I just wanna thank you for all the effort you put in to make the trails interactive. Now we're hands on the better. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, actually, it's I, 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 thanks goes to the schools. You know, they've really stepped up and, and worked with us and offered a lot of feedback. Redmond School District's been 100% supportive, even Crook County, and just a lot of groups have really stepped up to, to offer ideas, offer ways, offer thoughts on how we could enhance this experience for everyone. And even the Audubon has really stepped up and really supported the project and offered a lot of insight how we could build this in a way to, to just make it a great place for all community members. Do you treat street runoff? So street runoff is not treated here. That's our stormwater, which I'll put my other hat on, <coughs> stormwater division manager. <laughs> and so our, and if you had any issues on Sunday, don't tell me. <laughs> but uh, the, um, all of that water, is collected um, through a conveyance system. So you see all those drop inlets, curb inlets, ways that the water can get off the street. It goes into the conveyance, the pipe system, and it goes into either swells or um, you know, groundwater. Basically, these wells that are built underground, that, that, which are called UICs, underground injection, but that infiltrate it back into the ground. So areas that say we have risk of contamination, mm -hmm. we actually put filters, we require filters to be put in those. But most of them don't have that. So all of our storm water goes into the ground. So it's injected. Yep. Yeah. It, it, I say injected, but it, it's just gravity. It infiltrates back into the ground, which creates a lot of challenges because most communities just have a pipe to a river or a creek. And it all goes to the ocean. It's beneficial because we're, we actually got a cool system in a way that we're recovering our groundwater system with that water instead of just running off, going to the Deschutes River and going to the ocean. Yeah. It's helping recharge. Yeah. Um, speaking of the water, um, the, where the ponds are, in that earlier presentation, you said that that water will sit there and eventually get back into like the Deschutes or whatnot. Yeah. But you said that takes a long time. Yeah, it's, I, you know, it's, it, there's, there's, there's scientists or hydrologists that quantify that to some extent, like this is how long it takes to get to this point. But what's cool out here is you've got some aquifers that are pretty shallow, and, and then you've got the big aquifer, which is the Deschutes aquifer. So around 300 feet deep, a little deeper, going out, the Deschutes River is just right out there. So about a mile out there, so when we talk about the trail system, thinking ahead, thinking of the future. You got the dry canyon right here. You got another trail system here. It's only going to take a mile to get to the Deschutes River. So, you know, every town's got s something cool usually, and we've always had the dry canyon, but I just think this adds a whole new component for our community that really enhances that open space experience. But this deep you know, this deep aquifer deschutes, I really don't see our infiltration when it goes back into the ground out here have a big impact on. But these small, shallow aquifers, like, I can see it in a few days that we start recovering those when, when we switch to infiltrating down into the ground. Mm -hmm. The deep one, I don't, I barely see any, if I see any influence at all, it takes a while. 
But the deep one, it's recharging, recharges it bend and starts coming back out of the ground at um, steelhead falls or lower bridge. And uh, Opal Springs is part of it. And when that water comes out of the ground, there's no radioactivity that was created in the air in 1945 or whatever. Mm -hmm. That water's been in the ground longer than that. That's crazy. They yeah. don't know how long the water's no. been in the ground. No, you, you got to wonder if it was like a dinosaur year. You know, what am I drinking right now? I guess um, that other presentation, you had, you had talked about the possibility of piping water back. Yeah, we're, you know, we've really brought in a lot of stakeholders to challenge us. And so one cool feature is, you know, how do we, how do we add a lot of components to this? And, you know, just, just not just wastewater treatment, but have all these ancillary benefits. That other pipe that's in the ground, we have two of them, comes back to here. We have the opportunity to basically stake that pipe with a smaller uh, pressurized pipe and pump recycled water back to the dry canyon. And so at that, that area of Prashal, or right there close to the treatment plant that is designated for parks, <coughs> say that becomes athletic fields or some open space down there, somehow grass fields. Instead of using our groundwater, we, we can utilize recycled water to irrigate those fields. It requires a little bit different step of treatment that we would have to add on. Usually it's filtration, but we can do that, I think, pretty economically. And if, you know, if it balances out to where save, the, save our groundwater system and utilize recycled water that's already been pulled out of the ground to, to irrigate those fields and bring it up the dry canyon if necessary. As our, as our population grows, Usually that becomes more of an option. Too. All right, well with that, thank you. Yeah, you